folks and welcome back to another installment on my channel Second Chance um, today we've got a guest on who has been and lived through the tough side of addiction um, we are joined by Tracy Ford who is I met on Twitter um, through being invited onto a local radio station and Tracy was um, sort of the follow uh, following up on, on my appearance um, and speaking about her vast knowledge and experience of addiction and, and recovery and we, we got speaking and I just felt it would be something so powerful to to introduce you to Tracy and, and hear her story and um, I'm sure speak about the, the overall um, sort of power of addiction and the depths in which it can take you and um, yeah I'll, I'll hand you over to Tracy and if you want to touch on your story and now you got sort of the grip firmed around you and, and yeah I'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion on back of it. So, Thank you Kira, brilliant introduction. <laughs> Um, I don't know who's more nervous, me or Kieran, doing this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I suppose I, I, um, my story, where did it start? Um, you know, perhaps I've, I've worked out that my story, um, you know, my journey, or addic you know, the journey, the, you know, to addiction perhaps started when I was a lot, lot, lot younger, uh, but didn't show itself until I was a lot, lot older. Um, so my story is, um, at the time, um, I was in my 20s, I'd have never considered myself to be an addict. Um, to me, an addict was someone who robbed off the friends, the families, or, you know, sat on park benches drinking out of a brown paper bag, you know. Um, I grew up on an estate called Leedless Valley, you know, and a lot of friends who I'd grown up with, some, some of them, unfortunately, had turned to, you know, like heroin and what have you now. You know, I never saw myself as being... As you know, to make it's bad, you, it's mad how you can justify your level, you know, what degree or an addict you are. Um, uh, but for me, um, I was uh, became dependent um, on amphetamine uh, during a, it was a crap time in my life. Um, I was in an unhappy relationship, been unhappy for a long, long time. Um, I didn't go out and reach for drugs. My partner at the time were, you know, um, dealing drugs by way of earning some extra money. Um, and I'd just dip in what started in just, to, you know, having a little dab here and there turned into having a, my own stash. Um, but for me at that time, um, it helped me to stop thinking. I didn't care about anything at all. Um, and I just, you know, it just helped me. I was just like, I was just empty inside. Um, it had become my crutch. Um, but then... One day, um, I found myself um, in Middlewood Hospital. So it used to be a big, massive, old-fashioned mental health um, institution in Sheffield. Massive grounds, really grand building, to be fair. Um, I remember as a as a kid, we used to all call Middlewood Nut House, you know, and you know we'd refer to people who had been in there and what have you. And I couldn't quite believe that how we're actually in Middlewood, yeah. you know, you know, like. How the hell did I get here? Um, I'm watching your language because it would have been worse than that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually, literally said that it yeah. was worse than that. Um, but when it, you know, so there were an accumulation of different things, you know, that built up, you know, to that moment. Um, and I'd basically had um, suffered from drug induced psychosis. Um, um, it, it were a dark, dark time. You know, um, I, I I couldn't I couldn't have got any lower. It were it were a really horrific time being in there. Um, I were a young mum too. I got two kids. My priority at the time were you know, Christ, you know, if social services hear about this, you know, I'm gonna have my kids took off me. Yeah. Um, I already had. Um, I were already paranoid or. Um, I've always feared being judged growing up or being misunderstood. So I'd already got a bit of a complex about being a young mum, you know, because I got caught pregnant at 16 and, and what have you. I kind of do everything other way around, <laughs> you know, instead of leaving yeah. school in education and what have you. you know, I just did complete opposite. Got yeah. screwed up and then worked it out as I've gone along. But um, there were a lot of fear there. Um, and 
But, but for me, I always said to people, you know, being admitted into Middlewood were one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, and the reason I said that is all those people that I used to, you know, mock and judge, you know, or make fleeting comments about, you know, who might be using them services, in actual fact were just people who have been through some really tough life experiences and, and just couldn't cope. Um, yeah. That were like their respite. Uh, where they could get some support, you know, around their emotional, mental health and what have you. Um, and I'd wrap with that with two hands. Um, and one of the beauties about being in there was um, I, 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 were, I were took away from that environment that I were in, which would give me some time to, you know, really sit down and really have a word with myself. Yeah. And that's where the blog comes from, you know, have a word with yourself. Because what I learned early, what I learned in what became apparent when I was in Middlewood, and one of the things I learned is um, there are a lot of self pity and feeling sorry for myself. You know, I, I've, I've ended up here, you know, the people should have been here, it's not me, you know, and I was blaming everybody else. Um, I was angry at everybody, you know, I put myself out, I was always putting other people before myself, and, and, and I, have I ended up here? Um, I always people pleasing. Um, and then I just thought to me, a penny kind of dropped, not fully, <laughs> just a little white old moment. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, well, you know, stop doing everything for everyone else and putting them first. You know, you know, you've got to start looking after yourself. You know, I had to get honest. I weren't in a happy relationship. Um, I've tried to get out of it before, but I'd failed. Um, I kind of needed to, you, you need to look at what were happening for myself. And it weren't, you know, it weren't easy from a long shot, you know, by a long shot. Um, but I came out a bit more, a lot, lot emotionally and mentally cleaner than yeah. what I went in. Um, but I was still extremely vulnerable as well. Um, I came out of uh, Middlewood and went back to my partner. Um, they were all promises, everything would be fine and, you know, what have you, and I bought into illusion again that everything will be perfect. And it weren't before long before it just gone back to, you know, old ways and what have you. And it was just before Christmas, um, I was sat around at my friend's house, um, and we were just talking about men in general, you know, and I just said, and I just said, um, do you know what, I'm not going back. She like, looked at me going out, she wrote, what are you on about? And I said, I'm not going back, I'm not going back. You know, so I picked my daughter who were through about 18 months at the time and I went straight down to council. I drove down to council and I said, you need to find somewhere for me and my two kids to stop because I'm not going back. So they were kind of saying, oh, is there domestic abuse? Is there abuse? And I couldn't explain to them at that time because I didn't understand it. It weren't domestic abuse, it were mental abuse. Yeah. You know, coercive control, and I know it as, and recognise it as being coercive control, etc. Um, but... Thankfully, they put me up in a one-bedroomed flat, which were fully furnished. You know, it was perfect, you know. So I were able to go in there. Um, I had to deal with, um, you know, manipulation and what have you. And, you know, it, it weren't an easy time. You know, it didn't make it easy for me to leave, put it that way. Um, but I persevered and I, um, I was offered a um, masonette just down the road from me and that area is fairly rough now I can cope with rough you know uh, I, yeah. can't bother I could I can fight my own fights um, but for my kids it were a bit of a um, baptism of fire particularly my eldest one who'd been used to you know been going to a nice primary school you know she, you know I felt like I'd had to I'd dragged her away from her comforts you know creature comforts at seven she didn't know really you know any different you know um, I'd kind of moved. You're just carrying that guilt, you know, failure, you know, that you're yeah. having to drag your kids around with you. Um, yeah, it, it were awful. I had literally nothing. So when they, uh, um, when they said, oh, we've got your place, and I was just thinking, well, how, how the hell am I going to furnish it? I, I've literally got nothing, nothing. Um, I'd cut all off my ties with my ex-associates, you know. Uh, I used to do a lot of fencing and wheeling and dealing, and, and I were really good at earning you know, my own money, you know, cash in hand. But I'd walked away from that and I just didn't have no by means of, you know, getting myself back on my feet again without relying on stay. Anyway, they were a doctor there. Um and she said, Why don't you go and see a doctor? Um and have a word with him because I was literally physically shaking. Um and he said to me, um, 
called him Dr. Shrekko, and they never, ever forget it. So I said to him, I says, look, you know, um, I've been clean off the, you know, drugs for a while and what have you, you know, but I, I really can't cope. I, I, I can't, you're going to have to give me something to calm my nerves, you know. Yeah. Um, and what he did was he said, um, he says, no, actually, he says, uh, sit down and start from the beginning and tell me what happened. You know, mm-hmm. you know how you've got to this point. So he sat with me, Christ knows how long he sat listening to me babble on, you know, about, you know, what I'd been through. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he were absolutely amazing. He just, he, he just said to me, you know, you don't need any drugs. You've had enough drugs. But what you do need, I think, is uh, uh, someone just to lean on, you know, and be a support. Um, and I'll be your support, I'll be a brick wall. Um, so I've been discharged without any community, community psychiatric nurse or any, you know, support in community. Yeah. So he arranged for me to have a CPN. She used to come and visit me, you know, once a week. That's all she used to do. And I was like a little kid, you know. Um, you know, we'd set, you know, she'd come along and see me. We'll let you, we'll have, I had nothing. Uh, and, and just little goals, you know, like, oh, I really need to decorate his bedroom, but I've got no money, you know, but I, I'm very short of money. Um, and even I bought, managed to get some wallpaper, a quid a roll, you know, and my, my task was to wallpaper this room when, you know, by the time she come next week. So she was just setting me little goals that I yeah. could do. Um, and one day she sat down and said, um, so what do you want, you know, what do you like to do then? You know, what about college, school? I went joking, I got expelled from school. You know, I left school with no quality. Only certificate I got were a bill for exams. I didn't turn up, much my mother was not impressed. Um, and she said, yeah, but if you were going to do a job, what would you like to do? So I'd love to work with young offenders because, you know, I really, yeah, because I were one. Yeah. Um, I really think I'd really like to do that. And it was her who suggested going back to college um, and I was just like, no chance. You know, I'm thick. Yeah. I do like to say, I'm thick. I'm not going back to college. Uh, no chance. And the way she sold it to me were, well, look, why don't you just go? Because if you go to college, so my youngest daughter were in uh, primary school. If you go to college, it's free nursery. Right? So instead of a young girl running around here on floorboards and what have you, at least, so that's how she sold it to me. Um, and I started going to um, college and I just thought they were all weirdos. You know, I got nothing in common with them, really fell out of my depth. Um, and then it turns out I was were, I were knocking out some decent work. My spelling and grammar were crap, you know, but, you know, what I had to say, you know, and I really enjoyed learning. Yeah. I was learning, a, it was a social science access course and it were covering, you know, it were, I just found it fascinating, um, really interesting. And it were on that course, they did a counselling. Um, they had a counselling start part of module counselling. And um, it, the woman who delivered the, the session said, um, you'd be a really good counsellor. You know, after you know being a woman, a single mum, and everything that you've been through. Um, and she, I didn't, she said, I'll get, you know, I said, I can't do that. You know, she managed to get me some funding mm. um, to do a counselling course. So... I did a basic council. I did this counselling course, um, and on that counselling course, I met the project manager of a, a day rehabilitation program that operated in Sheffield City Centre at the time. And and he said, "You'd be really good, vol- you know, co- volunteering at our place, you know." So obviously, I jumped at chance. You know, nobody gives me, you know, none of them chances that appeared in front of me previously. Yeah. You know, nothing like that happened for me. Um, I volunteered at um, Kickstart. Um, for seven years, well, sorry, five years before I got employed for two. Um, and I think that's where my real recovery properly started. You know, be, you know, because up until that point, Kieran, I never really saw myself as an addict, or even at that time, there were no, there isn't support like there is now. You know, the, the drugs support for it were Rocking Young Drugs Project. Yeah. Um, and the drug support services were, you know, heroin, you know, were mainly aimed at heroin users, you know, they were not around social drug use, you know, such as amphetamine and, and stuff like that. Um, so that, that weren't around when I were in that recovery bit, you know, I'd never been referred to a treatment service, you know, you know, previously and what have you. Um, so, so yeah, the rest history, um, 
it, it's not been easy, you know, everything's been, it's not been easy, uh, but it's been worth it. Um, so 15 years later, um, everything's going okay. I've been, you know, just started university, you know, you know, I've got a job, um, working with families affected by, you know, I, I went for a job, but this time it was supporting the families affected by drugs and alcohol. Um, and the reason I was drawn to it was we used to have a family support group at the top of the, you know, uh, that ran every week. So that were for families that people were a part of service. And it was just a different insight into, you know, I used to see families as being controlling and manipulative, you know, because, you know, they wanted their priority to get that person fixed, yeah. you know. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of it is about going, okay, then what about your support needs, you know? So it were a different, um, it, it, were, it were a challenge and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so we set up Sheffield Family Friends Alliance group. We've got small support groups dotted across city. We got funding from Home Office, produce a video around family support, you know, really trying to raise awareness around um, impact substance misuse and addiction has on families, you know, because uh, they are the unseen victims. And then out of the blue, I've not long since started this job, um, my dad rang me from Stoke. Um, he'd been staying in Stoke, I'd lost touch with my dad um, for various reasons which I talk about, you know, what, which I talk about in the book. Um, my dad was quite a character. I used to think I was like my dad. A big hard git, won't take no crap from anybody, you know, he were a man's man, um, mm. always in pub and what have you. Um, and he rang me one day and said, uh, oh, Trace, I'm planning on coming out to Sheffield, you, you know, can I stop at yours for night? So I said, he oh. put me on spot a bit, yeah. I thought my dad being in my house, he'd never even visited me for, I'd not seen him for, you know, a few years, but he put me on spot, I just weren't expecting him to call. Um, and I just said, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, no, no worries, of course you, you know, of course you can. Um, and just before he was putting his phone down, just before I put his phone down, he said, I'll find somewhere to live when I get there. And that was that. And I'm just like, holy crap. You know, I, 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 at that time in my life, I was quite settled, I just didn't need... Um. I, didn't need I didn't need any extra hassle in my life. Um, and it's so we, we, my dad ended up staying with us for a couple of months. Um, and it transpired the reason why he'd originally left Stoke, because a lot of his family lived, you know, relocated to Stoke many years ago, um, is that he'd had a problem with, al you know, with alcohol, uh, were really, really bad. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, two years later, um, he died from alcoholism. It was a horrendous, horrendous time. Um, and, and we talked about it before, didn't we, you know, um, I think the different, you know, around gambling in particular or, or even alcohol, you know, the socially acceptable forms of gambling, uh, addiction, sorry, yeah. um, I think often are harder to deal with because you've got that constant reminder, you know, in your face, you know, I might have to go off, I might go off and do a seedy drug deal, you know, to get what I want, you know, yeah. and, and what have you, whereas my drug, dad's drug dealer were local off licence, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, we even went in naively saying, don't sell him alcohol, and they're like, how can we not, you know, my dad soon got around that, he'd just open his window, chuck 20 quid out and get someone to go and get him some, or best one where Summerfields had opened up on Manitop, and it were, spend 25 quid and it's free delivery, so you're just getting it all delivered, you know, so yeah. it kind of, well, we can't control it, um, um, but one thing I've, I had learned about um, my dad about recovery is, um, you know, he had to come to that himself. Yeah. You know, I couldn't force my dad into recovery. And that was an odd pill to swallow, uh, particularly when I were working in an environment where I was surrounded by recovery. You know, and, you know, so I'd like leave work after listening to families or we'll be talking about someone, you know, the loved one doing really, really well or whatever. And, I'm having to go back home and end a, a shift and, and deal with my dad. Um, so it were about 18 months in. Um, he, he, um, I, I backed off for a few days. You know, I, I'd not rang him. I'd had it, you know, I, there were a lot of drama attached with my dad. Um, and I'd not heard from him. And I rang my sister and I said, have you heard from him? And she said, no. And we were like, 
we better go round. Um, and when we round, went round to his flat, um, he just got all he round he round bedroom floor. He got green froth. It were awful. This green substance were all over the flat walls. You know, coming out of his mouth. Um, I thought I thought he were dead. Um, and we got in, got ambulance, and uh, they give him three days to live. Um, we got all family up from Stoke. We even had it. He even had his last rites. You know, you know, we got we we got that far, and then on the third day, a consultant came in and said, um, "It looks like he's picking up." Yeah. And I swear, to, I, I can't. I'm not going to swear, but um, I don't think she was prepared for my reaction because it weren't a happy one. You know, part of me was just dying inside, thinking, "I don't think I can go through all this again." Yeah. Um, it's just painful period, and I think everybody talks a lot about. Um, I'm just really mindful. I, I'm I, I'm passionate about recovery. I believe everyone's, you know, everyone's got a chance with right support, you know, to find out what recovery means to them, you know, not tools and what have you. But um, and I hate being a pessimistic, you know. But you know, when everyone's on missions to get everyone clean, I think we have to acknowledge that you know some people might never either be ready for it or have courage to tackle their addiction. You know, I've tried many times with my dad. I worked in treatment services. We commissioned them for crying out loud. You know what I worked for? I could yeah. get him an appointment, you know, around his alcoholism, you know, you know, to address that straight away. Um, dad, the support group, she come to him. I'm not sitting in a group of sat talking about the feelings and emotions. That will gain me in one of them. Anyway, I ain't got a drink problem. Yeah. He wouldn't take paracetamol because it was bad for his liver. Not to do with all brandy that we were having, you know, <laughs> at that time. Yeah, but paracetamol, it, you know, his logic it, uh, around his thinking were, were just... It were, it were an insane time. Um, and it's taken... But during that time when I were uh, really not coping, um, you know, but the, I'd lay awake at nights and it just made me physically and emotionally ill. You know, people were sick of listening to me moaning about my dad and complaining. My partner had had enough, you know. Um, when he came out of hospital, um, it really did change, you know. So we went from being affected by his alcoholism, you know, you know, the behaviour and stuff like that, to actually being his main carers because his physical health had deteriorated that much, you know. You know, so when people used to say, oh, just walk away and leave him. Yeah. You know, he didn't deserve that support. He's self-inflicted. We're kind of like, we can't do that, you know. We literally can't, you know, he can't, physically can't yeah. care for himself. Um, so, you know, I've grown up in, you know, worked in an environment where people practice tough love and I just think, you know, that that's all right, but um, tough love's not always easy. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was just going to ask you a question, you know, I mean, we spoke, you spoke there about your your sort of addiction and the mental health and um, when you speak about, as you go forward in the years where you're helping others and you, you're doing ever so well and then your dad's addiction is if you like, catapulted into your life. Mm. Do you think that, you know, very early on in your story, you spoke about a fear of being judged. Did, do you think that having that sort of your dad's addiction coming into your life and working in that environment, do you think that fear of being judged again setting and if it did and, and not that it's right or wrong but if it did was there any sort of part of you that started to get the old feelings back when you used to be you know have that fear of being judged and, and maybe you'd look to escape or, or yeah. look or look to yeah i mean um you know I used to go and have a drink, you know, you know, you know, I always, you know, so working at recovery people's, you know, feel people will say, you know, well, if you have a drink, then you're not really in recovery, you know, and that, my, my view is recovery, um, you know, I, for me, my drug use had become unmanageable and out of control. Um, 
you know, so I stopped doing what was making me out of control, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd always had, you know, a bit of a social drink, but never been a really good drinker, you know. And I really did used to question myself. There were days when um, I couldn't wait to go to the pub on a weekend, and I, I'm like, kind of one minute, you know, telling me dad not to drink, but then I'm going out because I need a bloody drink. You know, I, just I, would, come up I think you've just asked the question that I'm trying to ask. And yeah, you know, and I, I, and I remember it, it, from a professional point of view, you know, obviously I was fortunate because I had a lot of colleagues and close friends who been there on both sides. So I was fortunate that I had people I could confide in. Um, they, but from a professional point of view, I will never forget how I used to represent carers, not national carers board. Um, I was the first when they launched the Frank campaign, I the launch event talking about impact on carers um, and what have you. And I remember being in a meeting and um, I'd not really disclosed about my me, me dad's alcoholism and the impact it had been having because I wanted to maintain some professional, you know, to be professional. Um, and, and I was listening to some professionals. Yeah. Um, who not experienced it, you know, talking, you know, I just found it quite patronising and I, I don't know how I, I didn't stand up and scream in that meeting and just say you haven't got a clue what you are talking about, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think it's great to have guidance and, you know, support people, but um, everyone's totally unique. You know, I don't think you can be too descript you, you can't be descriptive when it comes to recovery um, or tell people how to you know, how they should be doing it or how they shouldn't be doing it. You know, we, I, I, I describe my recovery as being like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, so if you can, because I'm quite a visual person <laughs> and yeah. I used to struggle to articulate myself or find right words to say what I wanted to say. That's why sometimes I get conscious that I'm babbling. Yeah. You know, I don't Welcome get to my world. <laughs> so apologies anybody who's watching. Um, I'm trying not to babble. Um, so I kind of feel like um, at the time, you know, there were a, a decent off-made jigsaw puzzle. Then speed come along, <laughs> Middlewood, and someone just grabbed out that puzzle and just locked it up in air, you know. And part of my recovery has been about finding them pieces and putting them back together again. And there's been a lot of people who's helped me on that journey as well. So some people have been played a role in helping me go, oh, this is a bit you've not thought about. You know, this might fit. You know, it's helped me pick, yeah. put it together. Um, and and I suppose when my dad came back a lot, you know, so I, I, would build, I built a nice picture, I was comfortable. Um, you know, and you will, I, I'd worked a lot on my recovery and, and, and my triggers and, you know, I come to terms with why I was so unhappy, not with life. The main thing I worked out is I was unhappy with myself. Yeah. Um, and a big part of my recovery has been about learning to, and that's why I always say, have a word with this then. You know, <laughs> take a step back. You know, if people have come, you know, my kids hate it, you know, they'll be like, you know, morning, I'll go, oh, shut up, I'll have a word with this then. You know, and they're just like, you know, but I do think, I strongly believe that every single one of us have, um, you know, the problems that we've got. We do have the solutions inside of us. Um, we, we have the answers. It's just that the trust, as trust and confidence in ourselves and in that gut feeling or that intuition that we've got has just been shattered. Yeah. And we, we've lost that faith in ourselves. So it, it sounds pretty, it's pretty deep. You know, but for me personally, um, being able to know how I'm feeling and put a, you know, describe that feeling, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite an um, emotional person. You know, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm intuitive, I can pick stuff up, up a negative vibe or, or whatever, or, or I'm being paranoid. Um, but I really struggle articulating how I feel. Yeah. Um, and... Sometimes in the past, uh, particularly when I was younger as a kid, this is where I say you know, a lot of this started out then. You know, I used to emulate my dad. I wanted a big, big bad boy day. You know, I'd fight with lads at school. You know, but back at home, I used to get you just like your dad, which used to hurt because yeah. I used to, you know, my mum and dad were separate. My dad used to beat my mum up. That's why they separated. They were a serial womanizer. You know, so I was kind of like wanting to be like my dad, but. She was trying to get away from, you know, I think I, I felt that I were the constant reminder of 
a bad relationship yeah. growing up. Um, even though she she wouldn't have never have done that intentionally, I know that. Uh, but as a kid, that's how I internalised it. Um, and my, my reaction, my way of coping would be to lash out with words or with my face. Yeah. Because um, yeah. I've not learned how to express myself. Um, and it, on that, do you think whatever your addiction is, which is a vape now. Sorry, folks. I've got one of them addictions too. I'm addicted to vaping. Um, there's a fire alarm above my head, so if I if I had a vape now, it'd be a nightmare. So yeah, just on that, you know, when you you sort of spoke about being as a youngster and feeling as though you may be reminded of your father to your, to, to your mum, and at this point your father was abusive to to your mum. Do you think you lashing out, as you said, at school and having a fate and things like that and, and sort of feeling in that way, do you think that affected your decisions later on when you started to use drugs? Or do you think you was always... What well, I think what I'm trying to get at is your, men, your mental state at the time of what what played a part in that first use as well as it being time and op- sort of opportunity if you like but also your mental state at that time I'm trying to get I, to I that. think you know I've, I, I found myself as a kid forever trying to prove myself that you know I always felt that everyone thought I were a bad kid you know and and there'd been times where I'd, I'd shared you know I'd, I might have um shared with somebody about, you know, a vulnerability, you know, if I shared any vulnerabilities and, uh, you know, or I'm feeling a bit nervous, for example, you know, um, there is, you know, I used to have, you know, quite, you know, I used to be involved in, embroiled in quite a few fights when I was younger. There is no way on this earth, you know, I used to cap myself before a fight and it would almost a bit for like psyching myself up, yeah. you know, but no, I, nobody would ever see that side of me, you right. know. You know, they, they, I would like to people, you know, to, to yeah. different people, you know, so there were this front and there were this Tracy that I never let anybody see. So as I grow, got old, as I got older, um, you know, I, I was really protecting that, but I kind of changed and I started doing a lot more people pleasing and I was always trying to people please and, you know, trying to, trying to prove, trying to prove that I weren't this bad person. Yeah. And I think I kind of overcompensate, you know, I got a bit too carried away with that and just thought, oh, this is clearly not working. But when then drugs came along, I just didn't care. I stopped caring. Right. So I stopped caring. I really didn't, I really didn't care at all. You know, the stuff that used to worry me about what people thought, yeah. my part my family went straight out the window. I didn't care. So that, that part of me that we're all, I were always struggling with had been numbed. And, so, and for that period of time, while you were using that, I assume, were well, like a comfort to you then if you didn't have to worry about them sort of stuff? It, it, I, were, I, it were kind of a bit of a release. Yeah. You know, that's why I couldn't... So when people used to say, Tracy, you've lost a lot of weight. You yeah. know, my mum used to say, you, you know, used to say, express some concerns. I'd be like, you're just jealous because I've lost some more weight than you. You know, um, you know. I mean, every, clearly everyone around me realised that there was something not quite right with me because, you know, we hid the fact that we were doing drugs and what have you, you know, from, from obvious reasons, yeah. you know, from family and neighbours and stuff like that. Um, but my mental health did start deteriorating. You know, my attitude got worse. My attitude went other way. Yeah. And then, so although we're having sort of that little comfort or, or uh, while you were using, you didn't have to think, worry about the things that you've you've mentioned. I weren't worried about upsetting anybody. It didn't yeah. bother me. But you what, know, the point, it would bother me. But eventually, uh, it, as you've already described, it made, made your mental health a lot worse. So oh, that short-term release, if you like, led to long, well, Further down the line led to more problems for you. But I mean, I class myself as being extremely fortunate um, in terms of in in terms of, and it's not come easy. I've had, you know, I always say I've take had to take uh, 
risks, you know, we always have to take risks. Some are more positive than others, you know, so I started choosing trying new risks, you know, trying something new, you know, yeah. pushing myself out of my comfort zone. Um, because otherwise I'd have just stuck where I'm at. Yeah. So, you know, part, part of my part of where I'm at now, personally, um, you know, particularly over the past, I, you know, as what I was saying to you, over the past um, earlier, um, since COVID, you know, being having to be confined, working from home, um, was a it was horrific, you know, because I wanted to be out there working, you know, so I support people who are street homeless and what have you, and I wanted to be out there, you know, frontlining and, and what have you. Um, but it's forced me to have a bit of a uh, time of reflection. Um, I've I started writing. I found writing as a, a fantastic way a coping a coping strategy. It's something I used years ago. So um, like I said, when I used to have bad nights, I'd go downstairs and offload all my notes into a journal. You know, all bad thoughts and what have you, and then yeah. close it and go back upstairs to bed. Um, and when my dad passed. I don't have much of it. I've got there's a pair of glasses that I nicked off someone. They are it were for, he nicked them uh, these glasses off for a um, patient who were in expedery in Northern General. Really? We've used them them back. Um, so I've got them and I've got a couple of you know like his wallet and what have you. But I've also got these journals, and I can't. I can't for me. I'm doing my dad a dessert, I need to tell his story because, you know, he, he didn't deserve that end. You know, yeah. he might have drank alcohol, you know, you know, drank for years and years and years. Um, but he didn't deserve that ending. Um, and also, uh, the judgement, you know, I, I used to get defensive about Harry with Tretton Hospital as well. You yeah. know, you know, self-inflicted or, you know, like, it's almost like saying, you know, if it were, if he got cancer. Yeah. I'd have got more sympathetic, or my dad might have got more sympathetic. Yeah. But because we're an addiction. Yeah. There's that. You know, the, the response for itself inflicted just stop. It's, it winds me up when people say just stop, whatever addiction it is. Yeah. yeah. As though it's, you know, turning light on and off. It's. Yeah. It's not simple it, as that. If it were simple as that, I mean, honestly, you know, when you. You, you've over the years seen the other side then of addiction, uh, and in particular with your father, uh, when you sort of sat on this side of it, not not the user, the you know. Mm. Do you think? Did you find yourself, which is what I do at the moment, actually, wondering? I know you worked in that sort of, you volunteered in that line of work anyway. But did you ever find yourself taking a moment and thinking, when I was doing that with my addiction, what would I have listened to and what wouldn't I have listened to and how would I have listened to it? Um, how wouldn't I have listened to it? Did you ever... Because, I mean, when I, what I'm getting at is I, I've had one or two people, you know, come to me and, and I've tried to help them. Um, but I also... In making videos as well, I think sometimes I'm just wondering: Would I, when I was in the eye of my addiction, would I have listened? Would I have listened to that? If if they had come at that angle to me, would I have took absolutely no notice, or would it have benefited me? I'm I'm trying to establish that with your father. Did you ask yourself them questions, or and did that cause you some sort of? Uh, it, mental. I, I, felt, I, I used to. It were only. Into, this is quite eerie, but um, when when I finally put pen to paper and got some support in writing, you know, because I don't know how to write a book, you know, and I went and approached somebody, um, you know, to help me, you know, structure it out and, uh, yeah. and what have you, you know, and help with grammar and spelling and all that crap. Um, I, what I didn't share with a lot of people is I used to have a lot of recurring nightmares and I call them nightmares because I'd have recurring dreams that my dad were alive again right. and it just felt so real and um, in them dreams you know I'm, I'm trying to fix and do something that I could have done yeah. previously that I didn't Man. and that's mad you know, at that 50, you know 10 years on you know, after mm -hmm. he's passing, I'm still, you know, that anxiety is coming out in dreams. 
you yeah. know, and that I could have, could have, should have, would have, you know, do you know what I mean? You, yeah. you know, I can't change anything. I mean, I've worked in recovery field now for 20, uh, 25 plus years, and what I can say is that people, what everyone talks about a rock bottom. Yeah. Now, what's a rock bottom? You know, um, I remember a woman saying to me once, uh, her son were having an appointment in treatment six and said, uh, she said, so how long does this last for? You know, you know, like it were a bit of a cold or, you know, was, you know, we've identified this problem, right? Let's get him in here, let's get him sorted. How long's the recovery period, you know? And it's, you know, I think with addiction, it's not like a plaster cast, it's not like you break your leg, you go into hospital, yeah. you, you know, get x rayed you get a pot on, you recuperate, do a bit of you know physiotherapy and then you're you're, you're all right again yeah. um a lot of it's up here and in here oh, wow. the yeah. work needs to be done up here and in here um but what when people describe rock bottom i think it's when it's the reality of the consequence when they it, it's facing consequences yeah every single time so um my consequence were you know I oh, crap I took too much gear and actually I mean you know I can't take that anymore yeah you know it's not an option it's either my kids you know and um, that that just weren't an option for me personally sadly I know a lot of women who've lost their kids because of their addiction and yeah you know um but, and again everyone's rock bottoms really really different um and and trauma as well I do a lot of work around trauma informed practice you know um i would class myself as not being pre, tra- you know traumatized as a kid necessarily but then i speak to someone else who'll go yeah. oh, that? you know yeah. but I, I just it was just a working class normal working class upbringing you know everyone else like, went through the same crap you know i'm not unique to anybody else you know um i just think addiction can happen to anybody Nobody's immune, it don't matter what your social class is, you know. In fact, what we used to find is in, in the rehab, the people who had money, who could fund the habits, um, well, found it harder in recovery. Yeah. You know, it were the ones who uh, had it rock bottom and were in court facing criminal proceedings because, of, you know, because of, you know, all activities might have got, got you know, they didn't have ready access to money. That made them question that lifestyle and whether or not, you know, they, they could do that, you know, getting up every morning rattling, you know, yeah. then having to go out and score, you know, well, go out and steal some of it to sell it, then go and score and start it all over again, yeah. you know. You think, it's kind of like, it, it can wear people down. Well, you think on that, like, when you said people get up and they... In my in my case, waking up thinking, well, how can I get money for my next bet? Although I didn't have the physical symptoms, you know, it was still anxiety, I suppose, that I can get me bet on and needing that, that fix. Do you think one of the biggest issues, well, biggest things for an addict is dealing, I know you say about when the consequences, but for me, when I was in the height of my addiction, I can only speak from my experience, but and I knew there was consequences, but I dealt with them after. And one of the things in recovery for me is I'm able to see the consequences first and act accordingly. Whereas before, I, I did the deed, you know, went and obtain money by whatever means were spent every last penny and caused untold misery and then dealt with the consequences and also a little edge of like well I'm no good anyway so people might feel okay. sorry for me and what's point and mm. I, I, not that I wanted them to feel sorry for me because I, I hated what I was doing but th- I think it's like a little comfort you offer to yourself um and, and and do you think like in that in that sense I suppose the question is have you seen throughout your time working in recovery people make the switch to where they are thinking about the consequences first and acting on that and, and choosing not to use not to get money for a gamble or to whatever drink or whatever do you think that's a change that happens or do you think that that's just 
individual to me or do you think I, I think that comes from um, everyone's unique and different I think whatever what, you know what really helps is being around other people who've been in similar situations yeah. for me that really really helps the peer support so in Sheffield you know as, you, as you're aware I, I chaired the Sheffield Recovery Forum um, that brings together groups um, who have lived experience we call it um, of addiction coming through the criminal justice system um, you know homelessness you know we have people with lived experience raw people off the streets some yeah. people that are illiterate you know can't write yet that shouldn't be a barrier to engaging and and, and engaging people and giving them that help um you uh, so i think you know like support and we see things around us don't we i i, I oh, so oh. I kind of think you can learn some lessons by looking around you. So I kind of looked around me and gone, oh, I don't, you know, I want a bit of what they've got. Yeah. I want a bit of stability, what they've got, and I want a bit of that, you know. Um, how do I get it? You know, sometimes it helps just somebody else, you know, talking to somebody. Because if you can offload all that crap in your head, yeah. you know, and unload, unload some of that burden, um, you've got space to sit back and look at things a little bit differently. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, I always say it in my videos, like, I think when you speak to someone who has lived and been through and battled with the same or similar things to what you have, there's something really powerful in being able to relate for me. Um, it's knowing you're not alone. Yeah. Uh, I well, think I were abnormal, honestly. I genuinely did. You know, it's only been over the past few years where I'm like, um, I've got a broad Yorkshire accent, I'm proud of my accent. You know, um, I've got a couple of friends who can't understand the word I say, and I'm like, tough shit, you know. Oh, I've said it. Uh, <laughs> tough, funny. you know, that's me. Take it or leave it. I don't put on no airs and graces for anybody. And that's me being genuinely me. Instead yeah. of putting a front on, and I think for years I've, I've I've worn this mask, many different masks, you know. And uh, for me, recovery has been about, you know, this is this is me. Take it or leave it. You know, I'm confident in your skin. Um, I'm like my own like you either love me or you hate me. That's not my problem, you know. But this is me. I'm being true to myself. Um, and I just I, I'm so passionate about recovery. Yeah. You know, giving people it comes you know, that leg up yeah. and just saying. You know, you're not no good. You are, you know, you have got something to offer. I genuinely believe everyone. They just need someone to listen. It just listening to someone makes a world of difference. Yeah, uh, and on that, just before we sort of wrap up for this one, um, if there's anyone was caring for a family friend or you know someone close to them, and they're worried about them going through addiction, um, just in in your opinion, what what are some of the small steps or or big steps that they can take towards the first initial you know steps that they could perhaps? So in terms for for families who are affected or might be concerned, the immediate response every single time is to fix that person. Because if they fix that person, then they'll feel okay. Yeah. They're, you know, if they fix that person, they'll be okay. But the reality is, you know, when objectively is that person has to, you know, you can support that person and make suggestions and say, you know, look, there's, you know, there's some help, you know, I think you might have got a problem or you, whatever, you know, try and bring the subject up about your concerns, you know, raise your concerns with them. Um, if they're in what we call denial stage, you know, and they don't recognise that there's a problem, you know, they, they're not there yet. Um, then I would strongly advise people seek out some support groups or, you know, to be able to talk about what their fears and concerns are because they'll be guaranteed somebody else in that room will be in the same, in the same place. Um, and it can just, it can half off that pain that somebody goes yeah. through unnecessarily. Um, I think what you learn in support groups as well is you learn about addiction. You know, um, if you're not sure, you know, addiction is complex and multifaceted, isn't it? You know, you know, God, it's took me, I'm still figuring it out now after 20 odd years, you know, um, and I'm sure I will be till my last breath, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so so if, if somebody's um, confronted with an addiction and somebody who's entrenched in addiction, um, 
they need to understand what they're dealing with and they can get that support. So I would, you know, seek out some advice and some guidance and listen to that advice and guidance. Um, and then secondly is establish some boundaries, you know, but boundaries that work for you and that are, you know, negotiate some boundaries that are healthy for you. Yeah. Um, I, I think listening to you and you speak so passionately about recovery and, and addiction and and I, you, you are worth something and you can make something of yourself and to me um, just listening to you you're an inspiration I'm sure you've had it said many times to you um, but honestly I think all things aside and I know you, you you know you found a little you know sort of confidence now where you are this is me but you should mm. be I'm nobody to say it but you should be really proud of yourself cause, it, listening from where you've come from and the the beginnings in which you know from really a start of your addiction to now coming on here I think this is so powerful and, and I hope people benefit from that but I'm sure you've touched many people's lives in a positive way and I, I genuinely mean that and I can't thank you enough for coming on um, to, to share that with us and I was just going to say to you um, if if, if this is anything else you want to add before I wrap up no I mean what um, you know I've mentioned me writing and what have you you know just give me a little blogger you know um, so I write about my addiction you know I have a bit of a blog it's helped, it helped me write form the book so if you could put link on bottom that'd be great yeah well done um, so I literally there's no spamming or all like that you know if I've wrote a blog I'll just send an email and you get a copy of it Um I can send you some, inf you know, some links about Adfam National Organisation for Families, you know, affected. Um, uh, but also, like I've said, you know, extend the invitation to yourself to come along to the next recovery forum meeting, and yeah. just, you know, you, I know you, you think my my story is amazing. Wait till you get, because there's a lot more incredible. I think mine's quite dull in comparison to some of the recovery stories I get to hear about, and that's what really keeps me motivated. So when um, I got radio, Sheffield got in touch with me and said, oh, we're doing a bit of a feature on back of Kieran's story. And I said, well, I'm not talking about Kieran until I've checked him out. Yeah. And what I love about what you're doing on here, and I genuinely, you know, what I love about it is um, your honesty. So I'm going to give you a compliment now. <laughs> I'm not good at you know, accepting them, but... I, yeah, well, you've given it me, so you can have this uh -huh. one. You know... You know, there were a couple of recalls before, and you, I know it's like you get no stress out, so what's going wrong? Da, da, da. You've done absolutely brilliant. And I think when I read, when I watched your first podcast, I thought, good on you, because that's what, you know, I think it's, having NA groups and GA groups is brilliant, but we need more people talking about addiction. Yeah. Because the more people that talk about it, the less the stigma is attached around it. Yeah. You're not abnormal if you get hooked up into an, a cycle addiction. You know, yeah. I think the key is that everyone can unravel themselves from it again. Yeah. And that's the message. Brilliant. And I think that's a great point to finish on. And I, I mean, I'll put all your, you know, for your links in the description below to, to, to be able to... Also, can people reach out to you on Twitter and contact you directly or I'm, I'm still a bit dodgy around Twitter but there is a contact there's I do face I do a um, Facebook page called have a word with this then I have a word with this then <laughs> have a word with this then um, so I just put some stuff on there so I can you know people can contact me and on website Brilliant. as well um, but I'm more than happy um, we I'll put some I'll provide you some links so I'm all yeah. about sharing them recovery stories yeah. You know, he's marrying others. All in the description below, a bit time this goes out. I'll have um, put them in the description below. But yeah, I think we'll wrap up on that. And thank you for your time, Tracy. It's been, it's been fascinating to me, you know, because as we know it so far in this channel, I've, I've spoken mainly about gambling addiction, mainly because that's my addiction and I can only speak from my experience. But it's been great and I want to get more. Um, varying addictions you know people coming on and telling their story and and speaking about all types of addiction and mental health um, yeah, so. i think it's needed and yeah. I, credit to you um you know this is a good little project that you've set up and much needed thank you uh yeah so i'll leave it at that folks and uh, 
I'll yeah, catch you. I'll be coming to you and go and chill now. I'll have a word with you soon. I'll have a word with you soon. <laughs> right, thank you very much, folks. I'll catch you on the next one.